Morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, we've got a beautiful day here at Marine Baptist Church. Uh, one thing I noticed, uh, the, the editor of uh, the bulletin has told me that uh, the uh, author didn't uh, put the right title down. The title today is Judge Not Faithful Soldier. So, a different uh, view of looking at Matthew 7, uh, 1. Judge not, and ye be not judged. We looked at this verse several weeks ago in light of helping a fallen soldier with a moat in his eye to make sure we had the beams out of our eyes before we helped him with that moat. The idea of building a brother up rather than judging him is lesser than you. Knowing we are a body of sinners seeking spiritual victory and needing help from each other. Knowing his grace is available and sufficient for all. And we need as much grace as the fallen soldier we are dealing with. In your church, we're a band of brothers and sisters working to be effective as a unit to accomplish the call of our uh, captain. Coming on our to lift a fallen soldier, but we are soldiers for a reason. We do have awesome supplied armor we see in the, uh, uh, the banners behind us. We need to use that armor to complete our captain's call in his church. But how do we attack sin without judging the sinner whose sin we are attacking? Truth is, we're not the judge. A soldier never judges. His actions are not done with judgment in mind. A soldier acts only as the king calls for and leads him according to his law and his leading. Once accomplishing the call, bringing the sinner with the sword, Jesus can then judge as the king of kings. A soldier acts only within the bounds of the kingdom's law. Going any further would lead to a court martial. We have rules of engagement. The rules of engagement must be followed. The rules of engagement for us are right here. This is what the king calls us to do. Our king is Christ. Our law is his word, the Bible. Our leading is by the spirit. Our sword may be in direct warfare against Satan's kingdom. Our sword may be used to promote law and order. We'll be looking at that next week. Our sword may also be used to guard against enemies, foreign and domestic, as Ronald Reagan used to call for, peace through strength. We look today at guarding against enemies as sentries to call all into action where his church uh, is attacked. So please stand in honor of uh, God's word as we read Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 1 to 16. So Ezekiel chapter 33, starting so verse 1, we read this. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set them for their watchman, with the, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come, and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, if our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how shall how should we then live? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness, neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. When I say 
uh, when, uh, excuse me, when I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live if he trust to his own righteousness and commit the iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, if he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right. If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he hath robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Heavenly Father, we look at the grace of God, knowing that all of us have been iniquity, uh, committed iniquity and sinned against you, knowing that all of us are worthy of hell forever, worthy of a lake of fire, where the uh, worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And yet, Lord, you sent your Son to die on the cross. You sent your Son by his shed blood to uh, re redeem us from our sins and make us sons and daughters of the Most High God. And you have called us into your great army, your great host, to show your grace given to a lost and dying world. Lord, let us take that grace. Let us go into the world. Let us proclaim your truth that those who will hear will hear, and they will turn from their wickedness and their iniquity and be gloriously saved as you have done with us. And Lord, teach us your perfect way. Let us be bold, Lord. Let us be bold in teaching uh, uh, regardless of what the world wants to hear. Let us be bold going against what the world says is uh, truth and bring your truth, which is truth, to the lost and dying world that we may see souls gloriously saved. And Lord, let us uh, not uh, falter in our duty. Let us accomplish our duty as you called, that our blood may not be on, that their blood may not be on us. We ask all in your precious sons your name. Amen. Amen. And they can be seated. We see in this section an armed Christian soldier at the ready. He is standing as a watchman, wearing his captain's provided armor to defend against surprise attacks by the enemy. The shield of faith always near, repelling Satan's fiery darts. The sword sheathed confidently by his side, ready to repel assaults against his kingdom. Always ready to warn and receive help from the unit to repel Satan's attacks against the very walls of this church. We see here a soldier ready without judgment. A soldier called to warn of the enemy's approach. A soldier placed by the king to recognize the attacks of an enemy and call those attacks out. Taught by his word and prayer to remain in victory. As 2 Corinthians 2.11 reminds us, that Satan should get an advantage for, of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We know how he attacks. It's been given to us since Eve. He's not changed his attacks because they work. So we need to look at that and call them out when we see them. We are not to judge his attacks, but warn others that they can keep the kingdom safe. The soldier never judges. He only acts as the king calls. The enemies are already identified. We know who the enemy is. His uh, approaches are taught by the king through his word. We merely warn others that might be taken by his craftiness as sentries. If they are captured by Satan's craftiness, we obediently bring them to the king, who will then judge them. Judge not, lest you be judged. But act decisively against sin. Act decisively that the people will avoid the judgment that they deserve. The captain, who is also king, is able to place his soldiers where they will be most effective. Act according to his will, and we will repel Satan's advances. Warning of attacks that would lead his unit into sin. Warning of the, those outside the kingdom of judgment to come, lest they come and kiss the sun, as it talks about in Psalm chapter 2. We're not judges. We're faithful, we're faithful soldiers. If we are afraid of calling out sin in others, knowing that we are sinners ourselves, embarrassed that they might turn around and look at us as being hypocrites, it says right there, we will then be judged because we did not accomplish what the king told us to do. All of us are sinners. Watchmen to assure our church remain strong and can advance and warn others of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Warning fellow soldiers when they lose focus and, uh, and, be, and they're ready to fall into Satan's devices. Looking at that and preparing it for temporarily over Christ's holiness and lowliness. So as centuries, we need to guard in three different areas. The church itself, the unit, and finally, the land around us. So the church, 
The church is headed by Christ, who is captain and king at the same time. The leaders of the church, pastors, deacons, teachers, song leaders, those who are recognized as elders in the church, are called to lead his church by his ways as king, at the same time following Christ as uh, captain, enforcing the king's laws. All of us have a part to be his sentries to stop Satan's constant mirage against the church. And it is constant. Make no mistake. He spends every living day trying to tear down the walls of his church. If we stay true, they will stand the very gates of hell. But if we fall to his attacks, those walls will fall. He seeks to turn his holy church into a carnal playground, serving self instead of Christ. As pastor, I am accountable to Christ as king and captain. I'm also accountable to every one of you to lead as the king has caused me to, called me to lead, to work uh, as the captain has placed me in his <coughs> army. All, um, you must ensure I lead as Christ calls. Even Paul, the greatest preacher of all time, even Paul, who established a Gentile church, <coughs> and on his shoulder I stand as pastor, had that same accountability. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. If Paul didn't follow Christ, don't follow him. If you did, I don't follow Christ, don't follow me. We follow Paul and trust him as the Spirit led him to write Scripture. We look uh, to others and judge what they say according to his word. Acts 17, 11, where uh, our namesake comes from. These were more noble than those of Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Paul praised the Bereans, who checked scripture against his word. They weren't insulted. They were thankful that they were faithful to his word. So, when we have someone come in, judge them by his word, not by their elegant, powerful speech. Not by the university letters, not by their large followings, not by their appearances on Fox News, but seeing if their words match scripture. If the words match scripture, follow them. If they don't, ignore them. You must compare my words to scripture. You, uh, you must compare the teacher's in this church's word to scripture. You must compare visiting preachers' words to scripture. If they do not match, as a century in this church, come warn me. If uh, I fail to uh, follow what your warning is, if I'm definitely heretical based on his word, then you as a century need to bring that forward and remove me. We'll get to that in a second. But again, this is not my church. This is Christ's church. And I'm accountable to him and I'm accountable to you to lead you to Christ. And remember, you're not a judge. You're a soldier. You're a century. You must tailor your warnings to scripture, the king's laws. As you warn of heresy in the ranks, keep it according to his word, where thereby you can avoid church splits and uh, church problems, because it's not your opinion, it's what the scripture says. 1 Timothy 5.19 says this, Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. If a century, you see a problem, you go to one of the other leaders of the church. You pray, you discuss it. If you find biblical fault, Go with another senior member to the erring elder and lay out your case privately according to the Bible. If heretical and the elder would not repent, the next verse, 1 Timothy 5, 20, tells him what to do. Then the sin rebuke before all that others may fear. I am not immune to a rebuke. I've been rebuked in this church. And I was thankful for that rebuke because it uh, showed me an error that I had and I changed. So that is all of our jobs, to be centuries looking over each other, to make sure we don't fall in Satan's traps. We must all guard against uh, people seeking to destroy the church from the inside from Satan's outward attacks. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1, 1 to 9. This know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, um, covetous, <laughs> covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, 
without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heavy, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep in the houses, and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate according, uh, concerning the faith. For they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be made manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Now, looking at these verses, if you come up here and one of these people start preaching, it seems so obvious. I can avoid these people. I mean, it's obvious what they're saying. And if you are solidly in the word, you're right. But uh, remember Eve. Eve had no sin nature. Eve had no problem. And yet, walking with God, Satan still believed and deceived her. As Adam, as Century, was standing right next to her. So because of that, because of failure of a Century warning Eve to get away from Satan, here we stand as sinners in need of grace. False teachers will show great power in speech, in actions, in seeming miracles, discussing things of great concern to this world, but of no concern to Christ's kingdom, drawing your attention away from Christ and to the concerns of this world. If you see leaders causing the church to drift in the heresy as a century, bring it to their attention. And 2 Timothy 1.13 tells us what we're to do. Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast learned of me, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Hold to his word with prayer and seek to ensure his church follows Christ. If you do this, the church will accomplish its call. So, as a century, you're ensuring the leadership is placed the church on the firm foundation. Inside the church, we're all in units. We're all part of a squadron in uh, God's command, acting as an army, working as one. As centuries from the church in this unit, uh, that was purchased with Christ's own blood, we must ensure that the church with its leaders have been placed on securely on that foundation we just talked about. But any army must fight as a single body if it is to be effective. If you have people going all different directions, that army will fail. The enemy will find the, the gaps in the wall and they will go through it. Meaning a spiritual church must not fall into Satan's carnal traps as a body or as individuals. We know we must keep our own sword sharp if we seek to ensure a fallen soldier's sword is sharpened by our warning. Ensuring we, uh, who are holy, seek to return another soldier to holiness. As Matthew 5, 23 24 says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembers that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother, and then, Come and offer thy gift. Offerings are absolutely critical to the church, as they do two things. First of all, they teach us to rely on God. They teach us that it is God's finances that we use, and we are to support the church with the finances he used, that he gives us to support the church and glorify God. Um, and they also allow the church to operate. We like to keep the lights on. It takes money to do that. But unity under Christ is more important. It didn't say to ignore the altar, but what's more important? The important thing is to have that unity. Make sure that the soldiers have no audit against each other. Make sure that any split, any division of church is taken care of, and then come back and bring that gift. As Saul found out in 1 Samuel 15, 22, as he did not destroy his city fully, as God called him to, but kept some of the best sheep and, ox and oxen, <laughs> what he said for sacrifice. This is what Samuel told him. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than to fan of lambs. The foundation is set. The foundation is obedience. The things we do on that foundation glorify God, but the foundation has to be there. It has to be unified. It has to be followed. <clears throat> Satan seeks to remove individuals from the church by temptations to the flesh or by shame from sin. As centuries, we must be willing and able and uh, uh, strong enough to warn them if we see them straying. 
or bring them to repentance, a warning of the judgment to follow, if they stay within Satan's traps. All of us are capable of falling into sin. All of us are capable of, of uh, in fact, we will. And we'll do things uh, that need repentance. If we come to repentance, God will honor it. If we don't, we'll find his judgment. So we want to restore them to keep them from the king's judgment. We don't, not, again, we don't judge a fallen soldier. We seek to restore them before judgment comes to them from the king. In most cases, soldiers will respond to warnings and repent. Almost all cases. That's the thing that's so scary. Satan, Satan tend, uh, says, uh, boy, you're gonna, you're gonna offend them, you're gonna make them leave. Most of the time, people who have fallen don't even realize they've fallen. They've gotten away from the Bible, they've gotten away from the truth, They've allowed the flesh to give them a temptation, and they need a reminder, basically. They need someone to come beside them, to build them back up. Huh? If they're not willing to do it, they'll stay where they're at, and they will lose the joy, and they will stray farther away. But Satan does send spies. He does send tears in the church to try to disrupt the church, to tear it down from the inside. If warning a soldier yielding a dull sword leaves him preferring the flesh and remaining in sin, then the century starts church discipline. Turn over to Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. Matthew 18, starting verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word, may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it uh, unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. The first step of Matthew 18 is basically the first step we just talked about, going in warning as a century. The difference here is we see someone not straying that has already strayed. So, they've strayed. We don't act to judge the case. Uh, if, they, uh, if he refuses, no, again, the first step will probably bring someone back, but if it doesn't, the man refuses to follow. The man wants the uh, carnal life over the spiritual life, and he needs to be removed from the church because he's actively involved in sin. We don't judge. We bring the sinning member to the church, who acts basically as a court-martial under the captain of our salvation, who calls for such an action in judgment. Removing him from the king's line as the king's word judges him. Anxious to see him return to that line. Anxious to see him repent. Anxious to see him restored as a good member of the church. This is God's way of judgment for sin according to his word, within his bounds. It's not us judging. It's us using the Bible to try to restore that person or to remove a tear that Satan has put into the church. So let us as a church body study his word together that we can accomplish the king's calls, letting all avoid the king's judgment. Able to see a soldier falling in Satan's trap restored to his camp unit right here in Berea. Do we hold back thinking we're no better and afraid we'll be judging, our, uh, judging them? Our captain will hold us responsible as we did not warn the fallen man and instead left that judgment to the king. We will face the same court martial he did because his blood will be on our hands. So we have a church uh, with a firm foundation but its leadership is following Christ. We have the unit, unified as one, with sentries warning people when they start to stray that that strain will stop and will remain unified as a body, fighting as one, making sure that we are able to withstand the very gates of hell because we have put our trust fully in Christ and his word. What then? Well, a sentry is to call out sin in the entire, in the entire land. So we see the need for watchmen uh, over the church. Ensuring we keep the church with Christ as head, focusing on Christ as head. Warning of attacks against his walls, Satan, as Satan seeks to remove the lively stones of his members, knowing they remain on that foundation. As a unified body, the very gates of hell again will not prevail against it. We are a spiritual church, serving the eternal kingdom of God. What higher glory can there be? What higher calling can there be? But, we live in a carnal enemy territory that serves Satan. We were born into this hell-bound kingdom. We were redeemed from it and placed in a kingdom of light as a soldier under our captain because we put faith and trust in the blood of Christ to redeem us from our sins. As we have such mercy and grace from our king, 
Who are we to refuse to warn others in the fallen kingdom as called for by our king? It is incumbent on us to warn those still trapped in Satan's fallen world of his judgment to come. God reminds us of Proverbs 11.30. And he that wins souls is wise. So we need to work on winning those souls. We need to prevent, use our sword to present the gospel. How do we win swords? How, excuse me, how do we win souls? We warn of the judgment to come of a holy God against sin. Bringing them to the Lamb of God to receive the same grace we received. Identical grace to what we received. I'm no better than anyone else out there. I am presenting the grace that God gave me as a sinner and offers to you the same way you offer to me. Not because I'm better than you, it's because I serve a God who is willing to do so. Knowing if we do not warn them of the judgment to come by preaching the gospel to them, instead of facing the Lamb of God, they're likely to face the Lion of Judah, who will come and judge sin and put all sinners into the lake of fire because we did not do our job. We have no need. We have his salvation by his mercy and his grace. Doing so, he's placed us in his army, in the very host of God. Part of our call is to be watchmen for him throughout the world, warning all of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords soon return to judge those who chose the pleasures of sin for a season over the holiness and beauty of God. Desiring to serve Satan and his kingdom, who will be cast into hell with them with it because they follow that king. If we do not preach the gospel of Christ, those sinning will suffer in hell for all eternity. It's promised in his word. But if we do not seek to bring them to the cross as called for by Christ, we shall be chastised and lose, uh, lose rewards at the beam of seat. It will be incumbent on us, and we will hear about it from Jesus Christ himself. Jesus specifically gave the Great Commission three times. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 is the third time. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. A witness is worthless if he does not speak what he has witnessed. You know, look at the trial. They need eyewitnesses. If the eyewitness then refuses to bring uh, uh, what he's saying to the court, the court cannot judge, they cannot use it for judgment. I am a witness to the glory that he has shown me. I am a witness to the fact that he has saved me from eternal hell. I am a witness to the fact that he took this unredeemable person by his own grace and made it so I was redeemed. That's my witness. I have the witness of the Bible. He gave me the word of what the, of what the past was. This is how people are saved. If I don't bring that witness, they won't hear it. If they don't hear it, they won't get saved. So it's critical to be willing to speak of his grace as God may bring people to you to hear of that grace. 1 Peter 3.15 But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We are not to remain comfortably satisfied within his church waiting for his return. He has called us to be watchmen to all people, warning all of the judgment to come. The world does not want to hear of that judgment as they desire to serve sin. They don't want to hear that they're sinners worthy of hell. They want to hear they're good enough. They want to hear that their life is exactly what it should be. They don't want to, they want to hear that they're good people. I am not a good person. They are not a good people. I have been redeemed by Christ and made righteous by his imputed righteousness on me, and that's exactly what they need. If we are persecuted and demanded to stop under the penalty of law, under the penalty of even jail, we must trust God and follow that regardless. Following what the apostles did in uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 14 to 20, turn there for it if you would. Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 14. And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these, the, these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. But they have uh, spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man, in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach 
in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. That is the attitude we must have. That is a watchman to the land. Speaking of the things that we've heard. What have we heard? The witness right in this book. The law the king gave us. The grace the king showed us. And the joy in life we now have. I'm saved. Do I deserve it? No. But God saved me by his grace. And that grace is available to you. And that's what you need to learn. So we are called to do something very simple. To warn people of the judgment of God for sin. Not our judgment. Who are we to judge? Judge not, unless you be judged, right? But the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will judge sin. And he will cast all sinners into the lake of fire. I'm not doing it. I can't do it. I have no power to do it. But he will do so because he has the power and the right to do so because he is creator. <coughs> Grace is available to all. As uh, Romans 10, uh, 13 and 14 says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed him? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That's our job as watchmen on the wall, as sentries. We are to be the preachers, proclaiming his judgment against sin and proclaiming his grace that we can be saved from that sin. Now, the purpose of the church is to glorify God by making disciples of Christ. And as the Great Commission requires preparation to bring his truth to lead sinners to the cross, we must learn our captain's way and lead and glorify him by studying his way of doing so. Warning the church of heretical errors. Warning members who become deceived by Satan and protecting our church from the wolves in sheep clothing desiring to tear down the walls from the inside of the church. It cannot be torn down from the outside. If Christ is heading this church, it cannot uh, uh, be torn down by Satan. It will withstand the very gates of hell. But it can't be torn down from the inside. If we decide not to put Christ as the head, if we decide to follow the world's ways and compromise with the world, then it can be torn down from the inside. It will never be torn down from the outside. And Matthew uh, 7.15 reminds us, the order of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ravening wolves. False prophets are everywhere, desiring to, uh, to uh, devour the sheep. New religious leaders with great swelling words of heresy to draw pastors from his words to save his lies. TV preachers and others leading members to stray. Wolves herding sheep to ensure they never come to the cross. As watchmen, we're to warn of any and all attacks, wherever they may come from. You know, a watchman, he's looking everywhere. Where's the attack coming from? Is it coming from the woods? Is it coming with a great force from here? Is it coming from spies coming up the river? He needs to watch in all areas to make sure that all enemies, foreign and domestic, are guarded against and people are warned of them. If, they're warned, if we're warned of sin, we can avoid sin. If we're not warned of sin, not in the, book, not in the Word, not studying it, not people to, uh, helping each other, we will fall into it. So everyone here is an armor-clad soldier serving Christ. All of us be watchmen, warning of the king's judgment for sin. Be faithful and joyful bringing this gospel. And Romans 10, 11 reminds us, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. I am a child of the king. I am a son of the most high God. I am someone who will live in the house of the Lord forever. What more glory can there be? You know, I'm ashamed to bring that to the people's attention. I'm ashamed to uh, uh, share that with other people where they can have the same thing. Who am I to be ashamed of Christ? If I'm ashamed of Christ, he will be ashamed of me. So we need to make sure we proclaim his truth. Glorify him by warning of the judgment to come. Trust God that he will work through you. And then if you do so, you will war a good warfare. So, as we get ready to sing on 296, the Lord is coming home. All of us can stray. In fact, let me rephrase it, all of us will stray. We have the flesh around us. Even Paul worried about straying. All of us will stray. The idea is, you know, the century is back and forth, bringing us right back when we do so. So, when we stray, we need to constantly say, Lord, I'm coming home. 
I'm repenting of my sin and I'm returning to you. If we do so, this church will accomplish whatever God calls us to accomplish. This church will do exactly what God wants it to do. If we choose our own way, God will let us do our own way and we'll fail. So, as we get ready to pray, first of all, thank God that his grace and his mercy has saved you from the judgment to come. Thank God that uh, you, as a sinner, are now proclaimed a saint because his righteousness has been imputed on you and he judges you as righteous because he sees the blood of Christ covering your sins. And then proclaim that to everyone else. First of all, make sure this church stays true to his word. Ask God to give us wisdom to make sure that we keep following him. Ask God to help each other come together as one unit, serving God as one. And then ask God, how can we be used to bring his word, to warn the world out there of the judgment to come? I'm not a judge. I can never be a judge, but I warn of the judgment. I'm no better than those people out there. I deserve the same hell they deserve. So I can't judge them, but I can show them how they can avoid the judgment of God. And that is our job. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll close singing 296, Lord, I'm coming home. Heavenly Father, so thankful for the mercy and grace shown upon me. So thankful for the mercy and the grace to show all the people saved. The same mercy and grace available to all that you bestow upon the people of this church. And I pray, Lord, that we will use that grace and mercy to keep this church on a firm foundation. Get your leaders of this church, the ones you've called to lead this church in so many ways, the wisdom, the guidance, and the power to follow your word, your way, your will, regardless of what the world thinks. Help us to uh, continue on there by members, first of all, listening to us when we preach your word, and then calling to us if we stray. Help us, Lord, as a church to build each other up, to warn each other when they may stray, that we may all follow the straight and narrow as one, as a unit, as an effective army under the captain of our salvation to accomplish whatever you want us to do in this world. And then give us the strength and wisdom to be able to go out and warn this world of the judgment to come. We know there's judgment to come, Lord, because we know your word. The world does not know your word. Let us bring your word to this world, the strongest sword there is. And Lord, let us teach uh, your way, your will, and your power that those who can be saved will avoid that judgment and will instead be able to live in the same mercy and grace we have. We're thankful for Lord. We're thankful for the true and mighty God, the all-powerful sovereign God, who has given us his love and grace. Let us show the same to this world and let us not be ashamed of the gospel in any way possible. May us be precious sons your name. Amen. 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 And please stand and uh, we'll sing 296 and close. Please do stand with me as we sing hymn number 296, Lord, I'm Coming Home, verses 1, 2, and 4.
Uh, that's because we have the pleasure of us. But if we come home quickly when we see it, it's far easier than if we get way off the path. And each one of us can warn each other that we are straying off the path. If we do so, we'll help each other, stay closer to straight and narrow, and have the joy that God, uh, that God desires for us. So let's keep, uh, keep our eyes on each other. Let's look over each other. Let's uh, not judge anybody, but let us warn when we're going off the path. And with that, you are dismissed. Thank you.